So winning in the new normal, I'm going to start with a, with a short story. So uh, two years ago, uh, I did a presentation at a conference in Helsinki in Finland. And um, after the conference, there was a dinner, and I happened to sit next to three employees from Nokia at the dinner. And uh, 30 minutes into um, the conversation, uh, I realized that every single one of those Nokia employees, um, they have an iPhone in their pocket. Okay? <laughs> So I thought that was really interesting. I mean, uh, owning an iPhone and working in Nokia must be the equivalent of being a priest and coming into church on a Sunday with a copy of the book, The God Delusions. That's an unforgivable sin. Um, so over the dinner, these three employees in Nokia, they told me that whole story about what happened with this great company. Nokia, that at its peak, was able to get people to follow the mission with almost religious conviction but also a company that, in the rust from its success, totally lost itself. I don't know if you remember what happened in June 2007. In June 2007, the first iPhone was launched. And when a competitor launched a new product, it was kind of usual procedure that the engineers in Nokia would check out the product to see, should we be concerned with this, what's inside. And they did that with the iPhone as well. Right afterwards, the CEO did this famous presentation in which he said, from a competition standpoint, iPhone is nothing but an iceberg. So he says, former, former CEO, as you can say. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I remember I sat on the, on the plane back from Helsinki that night, and, and I couldn't let go of this story because, I mean, how could the same people that made this company so successful be exactly the same people that made you know, the company a huge failure. And while we talk so much about how to get success, maybe we don't talk enough about the challenges that comes with success. How do you actually sustain success? Because iPhone totally changed the game for Nokia. And I know from speaking to some of you guys that your game is also changing. So more competition, more constraints. So what does that really mean for how you sustain success? And with all my respect, I know you're the biggest in your industry, uh, big market share, uh, the biggest ship on the sea. But Nokia was too, and Titanic was also the biggest ship on the sea. <laughs> so how do you sustain success? How do you keep winning? That's just going to be the topic for my talk today. Let me just speak a little bit about complacency and relate that back to Nokia. I'm just going to do a, 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 a short test here, just to test the level of complacency in the room. I want you to grab your pen. Please grab your pen. I want you to take the pen in your dominant hand. Take your pen in your dominant hand, and then I want you to take the pen and draw a capital E, draw a capital E at your forehead, okay? Please go ahead and do that. We will not continue before everyone else has done this. This is called the E-test, okay? okay? So this exercise has actually been done by Anna Mikulinski at Columbia University. So what he did was that he had two groups of people. And the first group of people, he first gave a set of exercises and activities that induced the feeling of them, be, them being powerful and successful. The other group of people, those over here, he gave a set of exercises that induced the feeling of being the opposite, so being powerless and unsuccessful. Immediately afterwards, he asked them to write a capital E at their forehead. So now the big question is, how did you write your E? So how many of you in this room wrote your E like Adam Gilinski here? Okay, so it is... Reverse for people looking. Raise your hand if you wrote your E like this, okay? That's about 25% of the room, okay? How many of you wrote, uh, wrote the E opposite of Adam? Okay, raise your hand. Okay. Good. Here's the interesting thing. Adam Galinsky realized that the group that got the injection of power and success, they were three times more likely to draw a self-oriented E so it was reversed for the people looking. So the point being that the more successful, the more powerful you become, the less likely 
you are to attune yourself to other people's perspective. That's exactly what happened in very complacent companies. I mean, that's what happened in Nokia. So empathy goes out, arrogance comes in. So how do you nurture that outside in thinking in a company? So I'll give you a few examples of that. One company I've spent a lot of time with is Lego, and this is the CEO of Lego, Jan V. Knustorf. And he was 34 years old when he became the CEO of Lego. At the time, the company found itself in a life-threatening crisis. Jan and his team managed to turn around the company. It's very successful today. But despite the success, Lego talks a lot about how to keep writing that E so customers can read it. So here's a few things they do. First of all, they talk a lot about listen to complainers. Listen to complainers. Okay, this is a motorized excavator in the Lego City series. This product was produced three years ago by Lego. They produced 30,000 sets and sent it into the stores. They were bought by the customers, and when they were bought, Lego suddenly realized there had been a mistake in the packaging process. Okay, there was one brick missing in every single one of those 30,000 sets. That brick was so crucial that you couldn't collect that piece of Lego without having that particular brick available. So how many of the 30,000 people who bought this product do you think that Lego heard back from? Less than 2%. Less than 2%. There was a failure rate of 100% in the product. Lego heard from less than 2%. So there was probably 98% of people who bought this product and had an unsatisfactory experience, but Lego never heard back from them. So Jan V. Knudstorp used this an example of telling his organization that just because you get a little bit of negative feedback doesn't mean you're successful. Because when you hear from 5,000 people, you don't hear from 5,000 people. You hear from a million people. So that's one thing they do. Another thing they do is that the more successful Lego has become, the further away from themselves they have pushed the goalposts. So no one in Lego today is being measured on how much they sell. No one. No one being compensated on that. They're only being measured on how much their customers sell of Lego products. Okay? Because Lego doesn't become long-term successful by selling a lot of products to Walmart. Lego becomes long-term successful if Walmart sells a lot of Lego products to their customers. So, so they want to be in the same boat as the customers all the time to keep listening by moving that goalpost further away from himself. The last thing Lego does is that they challenge which industry are we really competing in. Okay? So in 2013, Lego earned more money than the three worst competitors in the toy industry combined. Very successful. But then the CEO stands up, and then he says, well done, guys. But here's a question. Listen, are we really competing in the toy industry? Because think about this. If a 10-year-old boy goes into the shop, and he doesn't buy a Lego product, what would he then buy? Would he buy a product from our competitor in the toy industry, Megablocks? Or maybe he would buy an iPhone. OK, if he would buy an iPhone, then the battlefield for Lego is not the toy industry. Then the battlefield is the children's room. Okay. Then we can try and compare Lego's growth rate with Apple's growth rate. And then even Lego will look like a beginner. By thinking like, rethinking the competitive landscape, Lego get the feeling, yes, we reached the top of this mountain, but actually there was just a small hill because the big mountain is up here.